Hi, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to this edition of Reline Live. Um, today, we welcome Shane Scott with SSA Environmental. Um, Shane is the owner and CEO of this company, and they are dedicated to fish passages and fish baffles, which we will be talking about today. Welcome, Shane. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about this. This has been a hot topic. Don LeBlanc and I have done a presentation on this and we had a huge turnout, which we have today. So one thing I want to know, um, many of you have joined Reline Live before, but we have a lot of newcomers today. So we do keep you guys on mute the whole time, but we like to make this as engaging as possible. So please use the questions box. Shane and I will be answering questions in real time today. So please enter anything that you have there um, or use the chat box if you wanna chat with everyone live or if you'd like to just chat with us, you can send us a note privately or if you have something you want us to follow up on, we're happy to do so. So in the meantime, I am gonna kick it off and let Shane introduce himself and his company. Yeah, good morning, Cassie. Um... Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you folks. This, uh, I've been involved with, I'm a fish biologist by training. Um, I'm, always, I'm a utility bio. So I've always joked with folks that my job is to keep engineers out of jail. Because engineers are always digging things and building things and it's always around water. So um, that's like most of my friends and acquaintances are engineers. So I like that community. Biologists can be a little squirrely sometime. And uh, I'm currently a, the natural resource advisor for the customers on the Columbia River in Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. It's a hundred different utilities that buy power from Grand Coulee on down to Bonneville. And there's a lot of fish issues you can imagine. And uh, the region was spending upwards of a hundred million dollars a year on fish ladders and guidance systems and uh, very large projects. But we weren't, once we get fish past those big dams, we weren't really addressing the suburbs kind of where these fish actually spawn, mostly Pacific salmon. So I met Kelly Hughes down in New Zealand, from New Zealand, met at a fish passage conference, and he came up with this genius idea for a fish baffle. So I'm doing this on my side and meeting amazing people. And two months ago, I had no idea what slip lining was. I learned that term. And then with Cassie, uh, learning CMP and RCP and all the different worlds of culverts. I, mean, I, I get pissed, fish over spillways and turbines and now it's a whole nother world. It's been, it's been very symbiotic. I've learned a ton, of, ton about it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the problem of Washington State and the, and the world. Uh, but yeah, that's, I'm excited to review kind of what we've learned to date and bring some of my fish passing experience to the covert world. Yeah, thanks Shane. So should we um, throw our first poll out to the audience and kind of we want to, you know, we've got some questions. We want to keep you guys engaged with us during this half an hour as well. So I'm going to launch our first poll question. Have you ever worked on a project with fist passage? We'll give you guys about 20 to 30 seconds to kind of answer. And then Shane is going to dive in to some cool case studies, uh, give you a little background, and then we're going to focus on case studies so that you guys can see real life examples of fish passages. Okay, I am going to close the poll. We've had 80% vote, which is good enough for me. Our results are 100% of people have worked on a project with Fish Passage. So you nice. at least have a versed audience here. They know what we're talking about. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, Shane, I'll let you kick it off now. Okay, so I'll jump into the presentation. Yeah, uh, I think that would be great. Oh, I might need to pass this off to you. Hello, oh, share. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Change presenter, it is now you. So yeah, I gave you a little bit of background. I've been, I can't believe 30 years working on getting fish past things. It's mostly big concrete structures. But like, like I mentioned, in here more in North America, you're addressing salmonids, uh, salmon, steelhead, trout fish that are pretty strong swimmers, economically and recreationally important. Um, but you also have some animals that aren't strong swimmers. You have eels on the East Coast and then work with Kelly down in New Zealand. They have all kinds of really interesting organisms, fish that have legs and eels and freshwater shrimp and a lot of kind of weaker swimming species. 
So he did a lot of work, Gilly did a lot of work on developing the concept of Lexi Buffalo, I think over a wider range of flow conditions. But here in the North, in the, in the North America, I'm gonna focus more on uh, Salmonid Passage. And the problem is we can get fish past dams, juveniles down, adults up, but once they get past those big super highways, they go into these smaller tributaries and this is where a lot of them spawn. So we're spending money trying to recover fish in North America and we can't get them to the, to the bedrooms, the bedroom communities through these culverts. So I saw it as a, a, it's a very big problem here in the United States. So the, the issues you have with culverts is it's not, it's an artificial stream. I mean, there's no complexity in flows, high water velocities, shallow depth, uh, laminar flow, steep gradient, and that all kind of works together to be a passage barrier. And you could get much more complex with a perched barrier or too steep. Um, so just in general, culverts aren't conducive to fish passage. And when a lot of culverts went in, it was kind of minimum, size them to the minimum needed because of cost. And looking back now, um, that not may have not been the best choice ecologically uh, to maintain flood uh, conveyances and different. And, uh, but the reality is, is we have culverts now and we need to address those impacts. So either you replace the culvert or bridge it. I have some pictures here, very interesting, or modify the culvert. Um, and that's where the baffles come in. Well, the different types we'll talk about. So just to give you a magnitude of the, of the issue, here in Washington State, there's a Supreme Court lawsuit lost by the state a few years ago that you need to fix fish passage that supports fish that are shared with the Native American tribes. And the settlement, it's $3.8 billion by 2030 to address about 19,000 barriers. And this is just an example. This is the, I think we're, we have more detailed information about fish passage barriers and design in Washington state than I probably any, anywhere in the world because of the Supreme Court finding. So this is just a database of state highway fish barriers that are being addressed by uh, Department of Transportation. And then our de Department of Fish and Wildlife has identified over 19,000 barriers in the whole state. This pick this graphic is just Western Washington, Puget Sound Basin and, and the coast. Washington's much larger than this, but this is just an example of the magnitude. So you have city, county and state owned highways and roads. And these are the barriers that have identified in, in just this area. So 19,000 known barriers and 84% of them are culverts. Um, the state of Washington is spending about, I think it's $30 million a year, designing about 30 projects and installing about 30 projects. And these are characterized and prioritized to get the most bang for the buck, which projects are gonna open up the most spawning habitat for Pacific salmon. Um, and so you get some examples of projects, high priority projects that are funded through this program um, you see two two culverts, one's perched, the other one's failed. And so you remove it and you completely bridge. And this is this is really the ideal fix. You bridge the active channel plus some width uh, and allow the creek and the creek processes, uh, uh, gravel movement, large woody debris recruitment. You let the creek move on its own with it within that uh, system. This is another project. This is in Connecticut. We've worked with this group on some of the first flexi baffle installations, but this doesn't look bad, but laminar flow, you get real high velocities through there. So they widen it up. You have a more of a natural uh, creek bed and the size of that culvert is larger than the active channel width uh, to allow the natural processes of those creeks. But you can't always do this. I mean, this is very expensive. We're talking millions of dollars in planning and installation and permitting, and it's it's very time consuming. And you're never going to address the 19,000 culverts. So culvert baffles are a way to modify your existing culverts that either aren't planned to be replaced for several years, um, 
or that's that's an, a viable long-term fix. And baffles are no technology. Kelly, we're talking about the Romans had baffles and aqueducts, um, but applying them to culverts. And there's a lot of work, a lot of hydrologic, or hy hydrologic on the effects of baffles and water flow in different types of conveyances, pipes, channels, different things. So it's well studied, well modeled. Um, and the concept is, if you're gonna tell a fish biologist or a regular citizen, you're creating a fish ladder inside your conveyance. And you create resting pools. So you have a jump in a pool and a jump in a pool, just like a fish ladder you'd see at a dam. You disrupt that laminar fast flow that uh, a fish can't, they have, they have burst speed and they have swim speed. And we have a lot of research on the condition of many different species on how far a certain size fish can swim and what velocity, what gradient. So what a culvert baffle does is it just expands the available passage conditions through a conveyance. Say culvert you have now, fish can only pass during 10% of the flow conditions. You put in baffles, you extend that to some point and it's different in absolutely every single situation. And this is just an example of the baffles out there, all kinds of cubes up to the top left, weirs and the flexible baffles there, plates, dissipators, steel, concrete, um, just so a huge Shane, variety. Of, just to of, clarify uh, for everyone on here, because I know we have some people who I think because they're new to Reline Live may not be as familiar with baffles. Uh, the, in layman's terms, the difference between a passage and a baffle is what you showed before. A passage is letting the natural creek oh, run through versus yes. a baffle is we're putting we're putting an external product inside of a pipe to yes. give them that same sort of um, oh, there you go. Yeah. movement. Is that correct? Yeah, to create kind of stream-like conditions in okay. an artificial environment. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Very, very, All right. very good. <laughs> so solid baffles. Um, They've kind of been proven for improved culvert hydrology. They're permanent, expensive to install. Um, and if your culvert is undersized, it reduces hydraulic capacity. And a big issue, um, especially here in North America, is it retains debris and they're expensive and dangerous to maintain. Uh, getting anybody in enclosed spaces, um, there's a lot of safety issues. And so you need a lot of kind of redundant uh, systems to protect people as they get in and work. This is just some examples of what you see with uh, solid baffles. They're on the left, they're steel, and on the right are those cubes. So it, sometimes it causes a little more trouble than it helps. So you run across a charming fellow from New Zealand that came up with a great idea for flexible baffles. Someday you have to have him on, uh, Cassie. He's just a fun person to talk to. I think he's on watching this right now. Um, so the, the flexible baffles do the same thing. They improve culvert hydrology. They can be a permanent insulation. Um, of course, they're not as durable as a steel or plastic welded. Uh, but I, we've got several installations, and Kelly could talk about his someday, 10-year installations. The big difference is they bend over in about three feet of water, depending on the design and the installation, and they don't retain debris, um, and they preserve hydraulic capacity. So in these undersized culverts, you can extend that range of available fish passage conditions, but then when you get above three feet of water, which doesn't take a lot, they bend down and they form a profile about similar to a corrugation in a in a steel pipe, metal pipe. So my engineering friends could actually calculate the effects of the baffles laid down on the hydraulic capacity of that pipe. Um, and they're made of where different polymers we could talk about later. Um, inexpensive to procure, easy to install. Um, our folks are installing four culverts, fixing four culverts a day. You get set up, you get the baffles, you could even cut them to size on the site get in there during low flows, winter or summer. And a lot of pipes or several installations where it only requires four or five of these baffles. If you have a shallow gradient, 40 foot pipe. So you can 
you can fix a lot of fish passage conditions and it's cumulative fixes. Our salmon and our fish and other aquatic animals have been impacted over many, many years by kind of death of a thousand cuts. We're putting band-aids on a lot of those cuts with these baffles. So you come up with a flexi baffle and it's a very simple concept, um, extruded, roto molded in a L shape and you cut those slits in it, depending on the diameter of your pipe to form an iris. You put these in, you put enough of them in at a enough frequency and you have a, a fish ladder in a sense. So that when we got to the States, I have a few kind of fun videos. I, I grew up in this area in Washington state. Um, in New Zealand, it seems there's a more of a focus on fish and shrimp and eel passage during lower summer flows. So they're trying to pool water. In North America, we're trying to slow water to allow these stronger swim fish to burst through a culvert. So there's not a lot of research. A main, there was one research study on a main about what water depth you need for fish passage. So I looked at everything I could find out there. And I remembered as a kid, my grandma saying, I need the salmon are crossing the road again. So you get on the local news channel and they always have these, these films. But I always enjoyed this. So I, I spent a lot of time looking at these various videos. Let me turn this down. What water depth does a fish need to burst through a, a pipe or over a bridge or up, up a slide? Um, so we came up with about half the body depth of a fish. And Pacific salmon, that's a, that was a chum salmon, chum or dog salmon, and they're our second largest Pacific salmon. And it came up with about six inch depth is the minimum depth. So if you have about six inches of water going through your culvert, six inch baffles, you have about a foot, but about six inches over each baffle, and you put them at enough frequency, you're providing better passage conditions for those fish. And these are just some drawings of uh, flexi baffle, just to kind of give you a engineer's view on this is this would be installed in a concrete culvert. Use the sleeve anchors, little washer. This is a flat bottom culvert, but you get the idea of what we're dealing with here. And this is kind of the before and after when you put the the baffles in and the iris is I think like a six foot, two meter culvert, and then after you get fish are able to get in here, you have the resting pool, and then they could burst over or around the baffle. And so you see water depth left and right, and then over the top. So you have a fish that this may be 100 feet long, and a fish can only burst 10 feet at a time. So this gives them opportunity to rest and get, over, get through that conveyance. And this is another, I think this is in New Zealand, where you're trying to pool water and let weaker swimming animals uh, swim through a through a box culvert. You could put these completely like in a installation in North America. I'll show you put them completely across. You can folk you can V them upstream to dissipate water velocities. Um, so it's a almost an infinite way to install these. So when it, the, the term I came up with is when we kind of diagnose a culvert or prescription. So someone calls and, and says, Shane, I got a culvert. These are the fish. What's our, our conservation goals is the first one. What fish, life size, or other aquatic animal. So we look at the, the shape, diameter, length, and what kind of culvert is it? And the composition, is it concrete, is it plastic? And the big one is gradient. Um, so I've worked with my smart engineering friends and figured out what baffle spacing you need to maintain that six inch water depth over that conveyance. So you can actually have the pipe change gradients. They just have your baffles uh, closer. So we work, we go through this, the discussion, send drawings back and forth, and then come up with a prescription. Say it's four baffles in a 40 foot culvert, um, placed 10, 10 feet apart. And I apologize for our metric folks, but I'm learning learning back and forth uh, different the different measurements. So this is just a brief engineering drawing of what we would get uh, for, this is up in the British Columbia, uh, 
for a prescription for baffles. This is part of a bigger project. It was a road realignment. They're putting culverts in and uh, they wanted baffles in these two sites. So I would supply these, yeah, 4.26 and three. Yeah, so the gradient's pretty steep in these. So they're one and a half meters apart. So this is all our metrics. Um, and this is actually the very first installation in North America, Johnson Creek, just south of me near Portland, Oregon. Um, you can see it's a 40 foot culvert under a country road. Um, they have coho salmon, kind of our third largest salmon, steelhead. They have a lot of resident fish, but that's real high velocity water and kind of poor uh, passage conditions. And when that culvert gets about half full, it pre precludes passage. I mean, it's just too fast for fish to get through. And here's a, a fun video of the good folks at Johnson Creek. Um, after installation, the first high water event, and they So that ripple effect or the baffles slowing that water yep. down. Yep. They'll drop some ping pong balls in here to demonstrate. Oh, nice. Yeah, nothing like a one to one model. <laughs> See, without the baffles, they'd shoot right through. I like that. Salmon like that. <laughs> yeah, those are really, really good folks. They're really creative on on uh, on some of their installations. We've got another second, and they're looking on two more installations this year. And just a community group that cares about their their uh, creek, and they're doing all kinds of different projects. But they're addressing culverts, and yeah. then, um, so I've showed you a lot of round culverts, but this are flat bottom culverts, two different types of installations. Um, some pictures. Okay, here's some. Uh, so here's some case studies. This is an eight foot, I guess it'd be CMP, I learned, uh, culvert in Connecticut. And this is a, a coalition of different environmental groups working together on installing these flexi baffles. And they have a, it's a resident, it's called brook trout. It's a smaller species of trout. And they space in these to help the resident population move between different habitats. Um, and this is, it's hard to get really good video because usually out here in the snow and rain and but this is another, just a real quick, you can see the <clears throat> effects on hydrology in that culvert with the baffles. These are two baffles in a row with a, Mad Made Creek kind of connecting the two. And then this is the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. So these are, uh, this is another large culvert, pretty flat gradient. So we spaced them, I think it was 12 feet. We put a large plunge pool at the bottom of this. And that's one benefit that Kelly has seen a lot of installations in Australia, and hopefully I'll go out and check this one out after this first year, is you slow down the water velocity enough, you fill in that plunge pool. So you improve passage conditions and erosion, which affects the whole structure of your culvert by reducing that erosion. And this is an interesting one. This is up in Ontario. This is getting more, more common in Canada where you have gravel filled in between these angled baffles. These are tar larger 10 inch baffles. Um, but this was a installation went in last fall. So we'll go see how it performed. Uh, and this is for more resident species, the smaller trout species in Ontario. Um, was there, a, Cassie, was there another 
poll question? Did I blow past that? That's okay. It was just if people had worked on projects with Baffle, okay. which I think after we asked the passage question, my guess is it was mostly yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so you install this, the bio, sorry. I was going to say, I think you're perfect on time. We have about three or four more minutes. So okay. yeah, I'm almost done here. Yeah. The, the evaluate. So the evaluation, and this is kind of why biologists get into this business is you get to go out in an environment and do fun things. You install a fish passage fix could be, you know, replace a culvert or uh, the barriers put in baffles. So you want to go in and check to see if it was successful. So you're looking for your species of interest. In the good old days, you would do electrofishing, which is still done. And then my favorite is you jump in, jump in the creek with your snorkel and you do your Jacques Cousteau down the creek and look for the fish, but it's really hard to find fish when there's, it's really hard to see them. So you really are never sure. And that's where this is something really exciting that's new, well, it's not a new technology, but this environmental DNA where you take a water sample, filter it, send it to a lab, extract the DNA, and then amplify it. And that's this newer technology. This is the technology they're using for the coronavirus to see if you have it. You have little fracture, fractions of cells. You can amplify the number of DNA to actually get a sample big enough to test. And there's a company down in New Zealand that that started working with folks where you go out and take a water sample, you use your caulk gun to push it through the, the little filter down here. And then you send that little filter in, do your study, and then you get, well, this is actually an actual example from uh, near where Kelly Hughes is from in Bay of Plenty, New Zealand. Uh, someone got in there, took a sample, sent it's the water sample in the lab, they did a test. And this is kind of the printout you get. Um, everything from mice, sculpins, smelt. It's, it's interesting down in the rainbow trout and brown trout. Um, so whatever has been in that water that's left any cells, if you take a large enough sample, you can identify what's been in there. So you could do a presence absence. You could look at where their cutthroat trout above this blockage before fix your fish passage blockage and then go back out and test. So that's a, I think that's the kind of the new frontier in proving the, your, your passage concept. So that's pretty much final kind of overview. Um, installation, I think is another, another whole conversation Cassie was talking about. You have plastic pipes, you have liners, you have concrete pipes. Um, we've got all kinds of different installations and it's pretty straightforward, but you need to use the correct uh, hardware for the correct application. Yeah, um, I think so. that would be a great reline live to follow up with this one in like three or Excellent. four weeks. We can do a yeah. installation one just on all the different types of liner pipes that are out there. Yeah. Um, even box culverts. I mean, we run into those right. all the time. Yeah, I've got several active projects. Pennsylvania, there's a lot of box culverts. Penn Dot is really interested in this. And so just to finish up, I mean, the kind of idea is to on the left, it's a great big fish ladder at Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River, just where I live. And then you're just trying to turn up a, a poor passage. You're just trying to improve a poor passage condition. And the flexi baff, flexible baff, just flexible baffles in general, but our flexi baffle um, provides that better fish passage environment, but also addresses kind of the significant issues with solid baffles. Right. I think that's, that is it. That's to, awesome, Shane. I think this was, I mean, you couldn't have been more on time. This was pretty perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I applied it that way. <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys. I know there were a lot of people who um, registered that were it, that are in New Zealand and the time change I think was probably pretty hard. And I know that a lot of them are wanting the recording. So um, that will be sent out uh, for those that didn't join, although they're not here, I will be sending out that recording in 24 hours. So you guys will have that even those of you that did join. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll add you to my email database. Shane and I will set our next Reline Live to talk about installing these flexi baffles into different types of liner pipes. We should, I think Shane, maybe, what do you think three or four weeks would be good? Yeah, that's. Okay, perfect. 
So we'll do a follow-up. I'll send you guys all an invite to that and your email. So watch for that. Um, if you have any questions for Shane and I, you guys all have my email from your confirmation. So just hit me up and I will, uh, we'll take care of it and we'll get them answered. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Thank you. Shane. Thank you.